Welcome to another video from ExplainingComputers.com. Over the past few months, we've seen the launch of several very high capacity hard drives, including a 32 terabyte Ultrastar from Western Digital and a 36 terabyte Exos M from Seagate. In this video, I'm going to explain the technologies that have made this possible and which will deliver even higher capacity hard drives in the future. So, let's go and get started. Right, here we have an old failed 3.5 inch hard drive from which I've removed the screws. And if I take off the cover, we can see the basic components found in all drives. Here we have the actual hard disk, what is known as a platter, which rotates on the spindle, and we also have an actuator arm which moves across the surface of the platter like that. And on the end of the actuator arm, we have the drive's read and write heads. The capacity of a hard drive depends on two factors. The first is aerial density, which is a function of the platter's number of tracks per inch, or TPI, as well as the number of bits per inch, or BPI, that can be stored on those tracks. Aerial density can be increased by placing tracks closer together to increase TPI or by reducing the space between bits to increase BPI. Aerial density is usually measured in gigabits per square inch, although it's sometimes also expressed as gigabytes or terabytes per platter. Alongside aerial density, the second factor that determines hard drive capacity is its number of platters. This drive only has a single platter, which like all platters, is double-sided. And it's therefore got two sets of read and write heads, one we can see on the top of the platter and the other underneath, beneath the platter. Adding platters to a hard drive obviously increases capacity. As you may have noticed during its working life, this was a one terabyte drive, with each side of its single platter providing half a terabyte of storage. The aerial density here may therefore be expressed as one terabyte per platter or 650 gigabits a square inch. And if a drive like this were fitted with four platters with the same aerial density, along with eight sets of read and write heads, the drive's capacity would clearly be four terabytes. Where drives have multiple platters, they are stacked on top of each other on the same spindle as we can see in this cool cutaway image from the Western Digital blog that shows us a nine platter drive. Until recently, most hard drives had between one and five platters. However, the 32 gigabyte Western Digital Ultrastar drive I mentioned in the introduction has 11 platters, whilst the 36 terabyte Seagate Exos M has 10. Cramming more platters and associated heads into the standard 3.5 inch drive form factor is difficult. Not least to move beyond 5 or 6 platters, manufacturers have needed to fill their drives with helium rather than air. As helium has 1 7th the density of air, this reduces drag and turbulence, so allowing thinner platters to be used. However, preventing the helium from leaking is a challenge and this may reduce the life expectancy of the drive. This said, due to the decreased turbulence in helium drives, it's also possible to increase aerial density by squeezing more tracks onto each platter. There are two methods that hard drives may use to lay out the tracks on their platters. The first is what we now call conventional magnetic recording, or CMR. Here, the track pitch is determined by the size of the write head, which has to be larger than the read head. In CMR, tracks are laid down by the write head with a small guard band left in between to avoid magnetic interference. The tracks can then be read by the read head and all works fine. However, once data has been written, there is some wasted space left between the areas that the read head needs to access and this places a potential constraint on TPI and in turn aerial density. Because of this, in recent years, hard drive manufacturers have started to implement shingled magnetic recording or SMR. 
and here the track pitch is determined by the size of the reed head. This means that when tracks are laid down by the right head, they are allowed to overlap such that the final track is only slightly wider than the width of the reed head plus a guard band. This track layout is described as shingled magnetic recording as the written tracks overlap like shingles on a roof. However, data can still be read by the smaller reed head that does not overlap other tracks. This said, with an SMR track layout, data cannot be overwritten without corrupting overlapping tracks. To deal with the overwrite issue, data on SMR drives is organised into append-only zones to which data can only be added. Append-only zones are typically a few hundred megabytes in size and need to be rewritten entirely when they are full. Hence, when existing data needs to be changed on an SMR drive, it's written to a new location and the previous location marked as obsolete. This requires complex data organisation and drive management techniques, including garbage collection. In fact, drive management for an SMR hard drive is similar to that for an SSD, where data can only be erased in blocks. Typically, SMR drives allocate part of their platters to be a CMR cache, to which data is initially written before being moved to SMR tracks. SMR drives do offer the advantage of increased aerial density and in turn higher capacities. However, they have a slower sustained write performance than CMR drives. SMR is therefore best suited for applications such as backup, archiving and longer term storage where data will typically be written once with minimal overwrites. And so, when choosing a new drive, do dig into the specifications to find out whether it uses a CMR or SMR track layout, and if it will therefore be fit for your purpose. I personally do use and trust SMR drives, but only for backups and archive. We've just seen how aerial density can be increased by shifting from a CMR to an SMR track layout. However, aerial density can also be increased by using a different recording technology to write data to the surface of the platter. Early hard drives used longitudinal magnetic recording, or LMR. This wrote bits of data along the surface of a track, a bit like bar magnets lying end to end. However, this is not very space efficient, and so in the noughties a transition was made to perpendicular magnetic recording, or PMR. Here, bits of data are written perpendicular to the disk surface, like lots of barbed magnets stacked vertically. This saves space, as well as reducing magnetic interference between the bits, so allowing for increases in BPI and in turn aerial density. However, even PMR has its limits, which is why the highest capacity hard drives now rely on newer recording technologies. In their quest to improve PMR, hard drive engineers face three key challenges. Firstly, in order to increase BPI with an acceptable signal-to-noise ratio, the size of written bits must shrink, so requiring a media with smaller magnetic grains. But this means that the amount of thermal energy needed to flip their state also drops, which decreases the stability of the written data. And so, in order to prevent unwanted flipping, media materials with a higher anistrophy, or in other words, a higher magnetic resistance to flipping, must be used. But, in turn, smaller bits require smaller writers, and smaller writers usually generate less field but writing data on higher anistrophy media requires more field. To overcome these challenges, three new recording technologies have been brought to market. All are new forms of PMR and fall under the general category of Energy Assisted Magnetic Recording, or EAMR. And, as the name implies, they all utilise some additional energy input to write data to very small grains of magnetic media. The technology currently used in high-capacity drives from Western Digital is known as EPMR, while Seagate uses HAMR, and Toshiba currently employs MAMR. I'll detail exactly what these are in a second. However, it's important to note that, 
just as with conventional PMR, all three of these technologies can be combined with either CMR or SMR. So, to be clear, and despite what some generative AI systems may claim, EPMR, HAMR and MAMR are not alternatives to SMR. Rather, there are now eight types of hard drive, PMR, EPMR, HAMR and MAMR, each with CMR and SMR variants. EPMR stands for Energy Assisted Perpendicular Magnetic Recording. EPMR was brought to market by Western Digital, who have also conducted research into other EAMR technologies. According to Western Digital, EPMR works by applying an electrical current to the main pole of the right head throughout the right operation. This current enables more consistent and faster switching of the right head, thus reducing timing jitter. And, in turn, this enables a higher BPI and so leads to a higher aerial density. Western Digital started shipping its first EPMR drives in December 2019. These comprised an 18TB CMR model as well as a 20TB SMR drive. Fast forward to October 2024 and the latest EPMR offerings of a 32TB SMR drive I've talked about in this video and which Western Digital describes as Ultra SMR as well as a 26TB CMR drive. The latter is an Ultrasar DCHC590 and has a claimed write speed of over 280 megabytes a second. If you want to know more about EPMR and hard drive technologies more generally, Western Digital offers some great technology briefs, which I'll link in the video description. HAMR stands for Heat Assisted Magnetic Recording. HMR has been brought to market by Seagate and is being delivered as part of their Mosaic 3 Plus technology platform. In short, HMR works by leveraging high coercivity media and localised plasmonic heating. But what does this mean? Well, the first part refers to using a new super lattice platinum alloy media to make the disc platters and which allows very small media grains to remain magnetically stable. And, if you want to know more, I'll leave a link in the video description to this very interesting Seagate white paper. In addition to employing a new media, HAMR uses a laser in its right head. Specifically, as Seagate explain, the writing process uses a nanophotonic laser and a quantum antenna that focuses heat for an instant with surgical precision, transforming the recording media in nanoseconds. Again, Seagate have some great documentation available, so if you want to know more, just delve into the video description. At the time of making this video, the world's largest hard drive is a Seagate 36TB HAMR drive, which I believe uses an SMR track layout. As the press release states, due to its use of HAMR, Seagate is the only data storage company that can achieve aerial densities of 3.6 terabytes per hard drive platter today, with a pathway to increasing per platter capacity to 10 terabytes. So, Seagate believes that it already has a pathway to one day deliver 100 terabyte HAMR drives. And, in pursuit of this quest, it already has 6 terabyte platters running in its test facilities. MAMR stands for Microwave Assisted Magnetic Recording. MAMR has been developed by several companies, including Western Digital, but was brought to market by Toshiba. MAMR works by using a microwave generator at the right head, which facilitates a successful right operation using a lower magnetic field, so allowing smaller media grains to be reliably written. In 2021, Toshiba first shipped drives based on its Flux Control MAMR technology, or SC-MAMR. However, 
It's also demonstrated a variant called Microwave Assisted Switching MAMR or MAS MAMR, which may deliver performance improvements in future drives. In September 2024, Toshiba announced its latest FC MAMR hardware, a 24TB CMR model and a 28TB SMR drive. It should also be noted that Toshiba is also working on HAMR drives and, according to this May 2024 press release, plans to start shipping 32TB HAMR drives sometime in 2025. For some years, many people, myself included, have been predicting the slow demise of the hard drive. And indeed, by 2030, it's still likely that hard drives will be a relatively niche end-user computing technology. However, for power users and in data centers, the technologies detailed in this video mean that hard drives will continue to be more cost-effective than SSDs for storing very large quantities of data. And indeed, in the 2030s, we may even see the launch of the first petabyte hard drive. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon. Oh.